Ready, set, library. Celebrate National Library Week with us from Sunday, April 7th to Saturday, April 13th. National Library Week recognizes the vital role that libraries play in our society. Enjoy our special programs and recommended books and visit our locations across Queens to discover, learn, and connect. For more information, visit queenslib.org forward slash NLW 2024. Teens, we hope you'll take advantage of this incredible summer opportunity. Queen's Public Library and Toro University are hosting World of Work for Teens, an award-winning service learning program for high school students. Strengthen your professional development skills, get a better understanding of the workplace, and earn college credits and community service hours too. Visit volunteer.queenslibrary.org forward slash World of Work for Teens to learn more. New York City's libraries are facing massive budget cuts. These cuts would force QPL to end Saturday service at most of our branches, reduce our classes and programs, carry fewer books and library materials, and postpone necessary repairs. We need your help. Visit queenslib.org forward slash take action and send a message to your elected officials today. Welcome to the Queen's Public Library Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its 10th year at the Queen's Public Library, Culture Connection is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. And now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. This evening, I have the pleasure to present to you Pulitzer Prize winning and internationally celebrated author, Michael Cunningham, to discuss his newest work, Novel Day, joined by myself and my co-moderator, Matthew Spector. My name is David Santos Donaldson. I'm the author of the novel Greenland, published by Amistad at Hopper Collins in 2022. I'm both a writer and a practicing psychotherapist, and my writing has appeared in various magazines, including Poets and Writers, Electric Literature, The Rumpus, Shelf Awareness, and Literary Hub. It is truly an honor to share this evening with my esteemed co-moderator for tonight's talk, Matthew Spector. Matthew is the author of five books, including the novel, American Dream Machine, the memoir and criticism, Always Crashing in the Same Car, and the forthcoming memoir, The Golden Hour. He is the founding editor of the Los Angeles Review of Books, and his writing has appeared in the Paris Review, the New York Times, Harper's, The Atlantic, and numerous periodicals and anthologies. Michael Cunningham's Day has been selected a 2023 Best Book of the Year by NPR, Harper's Bazaar, and many others. Literary Hub says, Day is an absolutely stunning portrait of humanity, a masterpiece. The Washington Post says, the only problem with Michael Cunningham's prose is that it ruins you for mere mortals work. He is the most elegant writer in America. Michael Cunningham's, Cunningham's novels include At Home at the End of the World, Flesh and Blood, Spethamin Days, By Nightfall, and The Snow Queen, as well as the collection of A Wild Swan and Other Tales and the nonfiction book Land's End, A Walk in Provincetown. He is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts grant, a Whiting Award, the Guggenheim Fellowship, and his work has appeared in The New Yorker and The Best American Short Stories. His novel, The Hours, was a New York Times bestseller 
and the winner of both the Penn Faulkner Award and the Pulitzer Prize. Raised in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, California, Cunningham lives in New York City and is a professor in the practice at Yale University. Welcome, Matthew and Michael. It's a thrill to be in the company of such brilliant, talented writers. And Michael, I have long admired your work and I agree with all of the reviews that I consider you to be one of our great writers of our day. Uh, not just of day, but of our day. Uh, so it's, <laughs> truly, it's truly an honor. So we have got a lot to discuss about this wonderful novel, and it really is a wonderful novel. And uh, we're really eager to dive in. And I know Matthew is ready to start us off on our discussion. But I was uh, thinking, Michael, before we start that, for the people out there in the audience who have not yet had a chance to uh, read Day, I was wondering if you could give us a short description of what Day is about. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I have to start by saying that I wrote it sort of during the pandemic. I will say after the pandemic, but we're not really in after the pandemic exactly. And um, the, the really difficult thing about it for me was I felt like on one hand, how can you write a novel set in the contemporary world without writing about the pandemic. And on the other hand, who wants to read about the pandemic? Um, having lived through it, you know, sure, I want to you know, bring on the book. And, you know, it, it, it was a bit of a conundrum because I felt like you can't write about it and you can't not write about it. So um, here's how it's set up. Um, a group of, a body of characters, with sort of funny, queerish family um and it takes place in one day in april but and the day is divided into morning afternoon and evening but each of the three sections of this day takes place in a different year so morning is the year before the pandemic afternoon same people same story but now we're at the height of the pandemic and then evening is during the as he says sort of sort of but not really post pandemic i really i i i wanted it to be about human beings living through as we all did something terrible and not so directly about the terrible thing itself Um, that <clears throat> that's beautifully put and actually kind of speaks the feeds kind of directly into the first thing I, I wanted to ask you about this book, which is, you know, I having seen it sort of described like it's a pandemic novel, it's a pandemic novel. And as someone who kind of resists, um, you know, that that feels like a kind of descriptor that bypasses what the book really is <laughs> as marketplace descriptors. I hope, that, I hope that's true. Yeah. Yeah, and and you know, really, to me, it seems to be a, a kind of a um, a love story or a, you know a family a family narrative. And and one sure. kind of small point that kind of popped out of it to me that that I, you know, there's that moment where Chess is in the novel, Chess being one of the one of the kind of um, members of this extended family, is teaching Edith Wharton to her college students, and she refers to this mm -hmm. unnamed Vivian Gornick essay. She says, uh, you know, she sort of says, uh, do, you know, did you guys read the the, the Gornick? And both David and I, when we were talking about the book, said, um, you know, we wondered if you were talking about if the essay in question would have been the, the end of the novel of love, um, which is, I think, the only one I'm aware of where, where Gornick talks even a little bit about. about, uh, mm -hmm. about. And it's a sort of an, an essay in which she famously argues that romantic love um, or a marriage kind of, you know, plot isn't, isn't enough to propel a novel anymore. Um, right. I, I don't, I don't know if, 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 you know, but, but I, and I remember even reading that in the nineties and, and, and rejecting, you know, just thinking, I, I love a, a, a good deal of Vivian Gornick, but that, I was always like, what about light years? What about the transit of Venus? What about, you know, like so many novels right, that I like. Right, right, right. What about, what about, what about? Yeah. And, and, but I wondered, you know, you just that you're kind of the conspicuous mention of it. And the fact that in that chapter, chess is sort of 
thinking a little bit about the marriage plot and 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 the sort of stickiness of that. You know, you she said you have no idea yet how persistent that motherfucker can be. She's thinking about you know the love story and that kind of thing. Um, and so I, I guess I just wanted to ask, um, you know, your your thoughts about am I am I right in kind of trying to approach this as a as a as a love story and and you know and if that if in a way that was almost a kind of repost to Vivian Cornick, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you and I agree, and I guess we disagree to some extent with Vivian Cornick. Sorry, mm -hmm. rest in peace, Vivian Cornick. Um, yeah, I mean, fiction just continues to be about our lives, and our lives just continue to be about love and other things. But, you know, it's, it's not as if we are suddenly finished with love or that love is suddenly finished with us. Um, I kind of think what she, what, what I imagine that she meant was that um a couple of things that um a love story was no debatable but was no longer a sort of sufficient model for the vastness of human life the way it was say when you know, jane austen where, 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 the, where the bennett family is sort of stands well stands stands in for all the wildly wealthy white people in the world but you know what i mean that that that, that um i think she meant that love stories family stories don't um don't stand in for the bigger picture the way the way they once did right um, yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I kind of took it that way too, and you know, or, or that, that essay was sort of very specifically pegged, pegged to a kind of, you know, a disillusionment, you know, kind of with, with romantic love and with, with marriage specifically as a as a hetero, nor you know, sexual heteronormative institution. And I, right. you know, and one of the things that, that you know, the other thing that of course folds directly out of that as it relates to this novel is that. The loves at the sort of the types of love that are being in being examined in this book feel, um, you know, they're not that. There's a, they are uh, asymmetrical. They are, are sometimes plural or hypothetical, um, you know. And by which I mean, you know, there's it's the, the sort of forms of love that are being interrogated here are very, uh, very interesting and 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 in some cases a little unusual. There's you know there's there's Dan being in love with it, Dan. Being the, the um, you know the, the married man in the center of it, who who is perhaps kind of a little bit in love with his wife's brother, uh, Robbie. There is the way in which Robbie, the brother, is in love with Dan and Isabel as a couple specifically, which I think is kind of like a very real and kind of powerful form of love that that I don't see written about very that well at all. You know, there's um, there's Garth kind of discovering that he's in love or thinking that he's in love with. Uh, chess after he's served as her sperm donor, like these are these, you know, and and the, which is just kind of fascinating because it, because the book doesn't tell us, you know, right. whether that is real or whether it's kind of transferential love, right? Um, and I and I, you know, it just strikes me that that it's this is something you've done, you know, incredibly well from for the I think the entirety of your career is right about kind of family structures and sort of intimate structures that are not just you know, kind of one to one, right? Uh, right, um, and I'm just interested in in kind of like, you know, what it is. That, I mean, yeah, you know, I would say what it is that draws you towards those kind of describing those kind of relationships or exploring them. But I mean, I I, I think, you know, because they're interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that, that's 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 a great point. Um, if if in fact we are not done with love and love is not done with us. Um, I'm interested in love in many different forms. Um, I'm so interested in a straight guy meets a straight girl and will they or won't they get married? 
Sure, but I can't. That, now we'll, we will now officially be done with Vivian Gornick, but here she is yep. for one last time tonight. Um, if she was talking about love in fiction and literature as only about those people. Right. I think, well, yeah, yeah, you know, we're, we're still interested in those people, but what about the many other forms love can take? You, you, you mentioned, um, yeah, these these two these two guys who are in the book. One of them is straight and married to the brother, the sister of the other guy who is gay, and they're boyfriends. Yeah, but yeah. they don't have but they don't have sex, and <laughs> it really felt important to me. Um, you know, you, you don't want to be too theoretical about your about your characters, but but sometimes you're a little bit. And I, I, I didn't it felt important to me that they have a powerful romantic love, but Dan, the straight guy, isn't secretly gay. Right. And um and Robbie, the gay guy, isn't in love with Dan in that, oh God, if, if, if only he would let me, I would do it in a second. You know, I, I, I wanted, I, that felt like sort of, like sort of cheapening it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also, I'm also, this is something else. Well, this is not going to make it, probably make anyone want to read the book, but um, another thing that I find sort of underrepresented in, fiction, because, well, because it's not very dramatic, um, is a love, a marriage, if you will, or some kind of a loving relationship that's, that's not good enough to be making the people happy, but not bad enough to leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I see, I, I think, I think the instance in fiction of, um, lovers who are either well, mostly intensely miserable and occasionally very happy, yeah. seems to omit an awful lot of relationships. Right. Are, Maybe you know, yes, but then again, no. This, but again, then again, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a that's a really um, interesting way to to. That's a that's a very good point. I I found myself thinking about um, you know just the the the. the Way that the marriage between Dan and Isabel unfolds, and and you know how, how it, it light there too. It's like there's no, there's no. It's it, you know, it's not. You don't really have a clear sense at the beginning, you know. And, and just as you know, you often don't in your own relationships. Like whether is this going to work or not? You know. Yeah, yeah. Which you may be asking yourself twenty years in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, I have been married to the same man for 37 years, and we are mostly very, very happy as shitty word. But you know what? You know what? We're, we're good. Yeah, we're yeah. good. We are. We're, you know, we're headed for the horizon together. Yeah. And every once in a while, still, as intimately as we know each other, I would kind of look at him and say, and think, and I'll say it, <laughs> Zoltar, <laughs> why have they sent you from your home planet to screw up my life? <laughs> you know? And I think part of what's sort of great about a long love is you 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 become very familiar with each other, but but you neither of you, or if there's more than one, two of you, ever completely sheds their strangeness. Yes, and, and shouldn't. I think. And shouldn't. Yeah, no, exactly. That's part of what keeps it alive yeah. and interesting. Yeah. 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 Michael, I was think, thinking, talking about different kinds of relationships and ambiguity and uh, the relationship with children and parents is a big part of day as well. And the part that I loved and I, I thought that you did exceptionally well with the capturing the inner life of children and also the relationship between parents and children and all of the, the uh, complicated uh, dynamics that go on there. Um, and one of my favorite sentences of the book actually is for, uh, about Violet. And Violet's, what is she, six or seven years old when the book starts? Um, 
five. When, yeah, you think I would know? Um, yeah, maybe five when we start. And when she's even when she's five, there's a sentence here I love. It says, "Violet, um, ever since Violet began disliking her mother a year or so ago, she has been more extravagant in her demonstrations of affection." Does she believe she can summon her mother back again, the engaged and attentive mother? And I thought that was so, uh, I, I love that sentence because there's so much in there, the complexity of, of, of the psychology of going on with, with Violet there, that, that she has to perform this to hopefully get her mother back, and yet she hates her on some level. I, so I, I love how you've written uh, children in this book. Um, it's beautiful. And we don't often read about books where where it's with adult relationships or at the center in a way, but also delve so deeply into the secret world of children. I think about Virginia Woolf sort of with like, with like James in the lighthouse, where she starts out in his perspective. Uh, but uh, I feel like you you take it even further. I, I think with this, with with uh, with the two children at least. Uh, can you talk a little bit about? your process of writing about children and getting into their inner lives and, the, and these relationships? Sure, it, I mean, on on a certain level, it, it's it's fairly simple um, in, that, in that I just sort of imagine, summon, build the characters of children the way I do anybody else. Um, I think it's easy to oversimplify children yeah, it's easy to think of childhood as some sort of generic condition, and I think anybody who has known a child knows that that is simply not <laughs> true. Um, and I, you know, I, I guess something I'm very much aware of in children, which is sort of reflected in in that little passage you read, was that. Um, well, like like anybody, they are capable of wildly conflicting emotions and wanting two different things at the same time. We, I get it about that. Um, and maybe what's a little different about being a child from, say, being an adult is um, it's survival. You know, you have you have to. You are dependent. You you are a citizen of the nation of your parents. Yeah. If they and until you get to a certain age, if they stop care, taking care of you, you will be dead. That's it. Right? You know? So a child is is at a is if not at, at war, a, a sort of a sort of spy. You know, a, a, a sort of a a a, 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 a being who of necessity. Um, has to find a way to work it so that so that they're fed and housed. I, mean, I don't think I don't think any child thinks this literally, but um, right, yeah, yeah it, it's 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 they're 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 complex and insidious and occasionally quite lovable and occasionally really horrible beings. And they're trapped, and they have to yeah. deal with being trapped. Yeah. I, I think they can be they, all the same. They can be exceptionally difficult to, to write. I mean, I think it's very true that, that children are are you know more sophisticated than than sort of you know, some of the sort of blunt. Yeah. Ideas about yeah. But but I would also yeah. say you know there's that there's that thing that I I find a lot in fiction where you where you find a child that's a little a little too good or a little too a little too something to be to be yeah. real. Um, and, and I and I think these, you know, this is another place where you you really, um, you know, I feel like you you shape them both in such lovely ways. And I think another thing that that that, that comes out of this, you, that I wanted to, that I wanted to ask you about was, you know, you seem uncannily attuned in some ways to the follies and shortcomings of of men, straight men. Um, there's, you know, there's, there was something about Dan that I found enormously endearing. You know, you 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 sort of paint him with. Tremendous sympathy, but he also, you know, the, the sort of self-delusion and the sort of vanity. Dan is a, a, a guy who's sort of thinking about a comeback, and he he seems to have a less um, less accurate or less true to reality vision of his marriage than 
and Isabel does in the end. Um, and there's a there's kind of a moment, in fact, where um, is it Chess who says it to Isabel or vice versa? Women always seem to know better, right? Um, mm -hmm. that's a, mm -hmm. Broken. And and I, and, you know, which I, I think is just I think it's true in my in my experience and observation, and but I but I'm I'm struck with that I'm struck by that as a kind of point of emphasis you know or, or what feels like a kind of point of emotional emphasis in this book or at least a point of insight, um, you know and and I and I, and I um, you know also seems like the writers who loom largest over this book maybe over all of your books um, are women too, <laughs> yeah uh, not you know thinking outside Gornick thinking of I'll ask you about these writers later, but Elliot. And so I just wondered if, if you could sort of, you know, speak to that a little. Sure, sure. Um, I have nothing against straight, not <laughs> one thing. Um, yeah. Several of my most intimate friends are straight men. Um, there's a couple of things about straight men. For one, um, over the years and the decades and the centuries, we've read a lot of stories about, about men. Um, and, and, and I think straight men, whether they are sort of aware of it or, or not, are in a really difficult position right now. <laughs> As would be anyone who has essentially ruled for millennia yeah. and is suddenly not so much in charge and, and, and is suddenly getting called out for things that, you know, no, the king just does this. The king has always done this. And, and, you know, I think it can be confusing and difficult and angry making in ways I understand to have been the one who called the shots forever and now suddenly Oh, maybe not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, obviously, uh, it's for the better <laughs> that, <laughs> that was the case, and we, we we hope that. I mean, you know, we we hope that uh, the, the, there are obviously revanchist elements in this country that would like to uh, reverse that trend. But um, but yeah, I, you know, it, it just struck me as something that the that the book is, um, you know, just one one of kind of many things about the book. But, something that I just struck me as a strength for the market. Well, yeah, and I, just, uh, I also think that part of what's going on um, is this, a sort of, I like to think of it as a last ditch effort on the mm -hmm. part of men to stay in power yeah. by, well, hey, let's outlaw abortion. That would work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what it doesn't. Um, yeah, Michael, I wanted to. It's a little bit of a, a different kind of question. Now we're, we're going to get back to more about the novel, but I have a general question about craft for you. Huh? So, uh, I've heard you describe yourself uh, in, in terms of being a writer to be an with the greatest respect, a uh -huh. language whore, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> I was there when you said it. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a, there's a yeah. So go ahead. So no, I love that. I love that because uh, I love the way that you work with language. I mean, there were throughout reading day, there were so many beautiful phrases and sentences that I I reread and underlined. Uh, and, and I, you know, Francine Prose says on the back of the book that Cunningham writes such seductive sentences that we have to keep reminding ourselves to step back and pay attention to his appealing characters. Thank you, Francine. Isn't that um, nice, but it's, but yeah. it's, uh, I can see why she says that because you do write such beautiful. But so my, this is my question for you, and it's a little bit selfish because I'm a writer interested in your insights here. But how do you know when? your language is overshadowing either your characters or the business of moving on with the story. I know well, uh, when, I, yeah. when you spoke last couple of weeks ago, you said you were talking about a teacher you had who made you cross out 
all the sentences that you loved the most that you thought were good writing yeah. uh, in the process. So what is that? I love that. That was I, that really stuck with me. I, I I love that as a writer. It's good to remember. So what is for you now, uh, having reached what I consider to be mastery of this uh, of this practice? Well, what is the process like just for you now in finding that balance between being a so-called language whore and telling your story and getting on with the story? Hey, I'm, I'm, it's, a, it's a very quick aside about, about um, yeah. how I came to refer my, to myself as a language whore. I was on um, a jury with two other people and we were going to read like 350 books and narrow it down to three nominees for one prize and we said okay before we start reading let's could we just go around the circle of three and talk about like what what quality in a story do you feel most vulnerable you know like like what are you a sucker for if you yeah. will like 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 what um, one of the people said, you know, I really like a story and it's hard for me to feel this, feel wrongly about something that doesn't move and conclude. Um, the other person said, well, you know, I just have to fall in love. I can't really, but I know it when I see it. And I said, and I'm a language whore. And we each, and as we went through some, I, you know, one of what I, one of us would point to one of the others. Story whore, <laughs> language whore, <laughs> and by language whore, I, you know, I, I just mean certainly for the purposes of reading 350 books that I am, I so love beautiful writing that I could certainly, in the weird position of having having actually to evaluate books. Um, I can say, oh, this is just so beautifully written. Yeah, the characters are, are kind of ciphers, and but, but but it's so beautifully written. And sometimes somebody has to sort of slap me around about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I did. But yes, that fabulous teacher who told, who told me to kind of grade sentences of either A or B and then rewrite the A sentences. Which she, it's great. And what she meant was um, there is a fine but sort of important line between trying to write beautifully and trying to write beautifully. You know, so that there's a difference between powerful language that's the story and powerful language is actually there to demonstrate the precocity of the writer. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote that sentence. Nice, huh? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, but but that's not but you need to one if if one is a certain kind of writer, you need you need to be on the lookout for that. It's a story yeah. is not an advertisement for your ability to write the story. A story has a life of its own and you are finally secondary and in service to the story. In service to that, right. Yeah. 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 yeah that's um uh, not always easy to tell, but it is. <laughs> no, no, I I have a um, I have a little SWAT team of readers who who you know call me on all kinds of things in a, a draft, but um, they one of them in particular, my friend, mm -hmm. my friend. If I'm a language whore, she's a language cop. Um, <laughs> No, because she because she she is especially good at saying this is fine. This is a little too much, mm. and I I need help with that, and I and I I always will. Yeah, yeah, seems good to me. But you know, when you uh, yeah, right, that's a little much. Tone it down, down Daddy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a SWAT team for that. I might, might need to. I'll ask you for their number later. Uh, <laughs> um, one one other way of, of thinking about this book in particular, it, it struck me is uh, bear with me for a moment is as almost as a kind of ghost story, um, not in yeah. the Stephen King sense, but very much more in the sort of Henry James one. 
And I, and I mean that because all of these people seem haunted by alternate versions of themselves. Yeah. Uh, right. Whether that's Robbie, whether that's Dan's comeback or, or Robbie's decision to become a school teacher instead, you know, or, or, or the, really the obvious one, which is Wolf, the, the right. grand persona that Robbie has created. And, you know, it strikes me that these, these kinds of yearnings, these kinds of, of, of kind of, you know, um, uh, you know, you're yearning for, for versions of themselves that might not quite exist or versions of each other that might not quite exist. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Be really more than you know, more than kind of you know, so maybe even more traditional kind of like forward driving desires or what seem to be what kind of impel this book, and I, I, I absolutely love that. Like I think it gives it you know a, a kind of richness and a and a um, you know just a, a, a an emotional breadth that I find um, quite thrilling and and really. Um, really unusual and I, and I just wondered you know if, if does that seem uh, you know if you, if you could sort of talk about that a little or, sure. or yeah sure sure um yeah yeah it's absolutely true that pretty much everybody including at least one of the children is sort of looking for a, a what they would consider a better version of themselves but you know that's one of those things I wonder if you both find this also. Um, or I put this, okay. I think a novel or a story, certainly, but certainly a novel wants to be some sort of mix of that which is intentional, mm -hmm. that which is intuitive, and that which that which is entirely random. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you mix those three things up, it begins to look like life in a way that it doesn't so much without one of those three basic ingredients. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that all these people are sort of yearning to be someone else, um, intuitive, not, not, not intentional. And, you know, it's one of the reasons <laughs> that I think there are... Um, and should be scholars and well, should there be critics is another question, but um, I've never felt like the writer is the ultimate authority on their stories because people will tell me about things, patterns, images. And I think, well, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And I don't, again, I'm not sure if that stuff is accidental, but it's not as if you, set out to yeah. do it um and okay this is not something that i'm actively conscious of but you know i think i do somewhere back in the in the in the other regions have this okay rich white people what's the problem yeah. and of course there's always a problem Right. Um, but you know what I mean? I, I, I think, again, unconsciously, semi-consciously, um, I, I don't ever want to imagine or convey the notion that um, you are more fortunate than almost anybody. And that's a, and that's a real fact, but right. let's, Let's let's talk about how even that outfit doesn't necessarily fit. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that in the book where where Dan where, uh, <clears throat> Dan is struggling with his son's ability to, to glide glide through being privileged and white and wanting him not to uh, take on the burden of that, but hoping that someday he understands yeah. yeah 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 i mean yes. you know what uh, yeah um, no, i i i don't know I, I, um yeah spe speaking as we were of the of the fact that that 
white guys don't rule as absolutely as they as they did. I, I think um, white people in I, and I am a white person. There's no denying it. And you know, white people we dress beautifully. We have the we can dance. You know, we, they were fabulous in so many ways. Um, but I I think not only do white men no longer rule we I mean, look at what look at the books that are out now the books are not by and about white people predominantly anymore yeah what's and, that like for what that is what is that like for you because you are as you said you are a white male and you're right and even in publishing the sort of what's being more and more centered are stories about identity and identity politics and that's you know that's that's a shift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're making this. What did, what's that like for you? You know, I was dealt the hand I was dealt. Um, and you know, it was it was a winning hand for so long. And it's not it's not a not winning. You know what I mean? The, the, um, yeah, I mean, how could I possibly not feel really great about the doors opening so much more widely. I'm going to blank on the guy's name, but I just finished this fantastic novel called um, Martyr. Oh yes, I, I, I just I love it. it. Yeah, really good novel, right? isn't it? Yeah, it's really great. I love good. it. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. And it's good because he's some kind of genius, but but it's also good because um, he and his the people around him have a real story to tell. You know, they escaped from a country and, you know, and, and were doctors and are now chicken farmers. And, you know, that's. Well, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are real, there are lot, there are lots of stories we haven't heard that we're just starting to hear now. And what's, what's not to like about that? Yeah. I've, um, I'm a psychotherapist also, I was saying. And when, when I was reading this, I, I, I was thinking a lot about uh, reading about Robbie's Instagram uh, persona, Wolf. For the readers who don't really know, this, there's a character who has invented a, a persona that is sort of this version of himself or a version that he wants to be on, on Instagram. That's a fake person called Wolf. So, so in the persona, as far as Jung can be, Jung uh, says is uh, the personality we choose, how we wish ourselves to be seen, uh, which is not necessarily a problem in the Jungian terms, but the problem becomes when we over-identify with this persona, believing this artificial thing to be our true identity. Right, 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 and at one point you say, you know, wolf, wolf is a, an idea of a person, right? Uh, but then you say, then you say, can there be harm in that? There can be no harm in that, can there? So I'm curious to hear what sparked this idea to write about as someone who's sort of vicariously living a persona. And do you think there can be harm in that? Um, oh, I think there can be harm in just about anything. Um, <laughs> well, <that's true. laughs> if, you, if you look closely enough. That's true. Um, you but know, you, know, you, know, you chose to write about that kind of this idea, so for a reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I did, as, as you said, um, this this sort of avatar um, is this guy Robbie's sort of sense of who he would be if the lights were turned on a little brighter, if the volume was a little clearer, you know, this imaginary person is actually sort of Robbie's improved self, his better twin, his his boyfriend from another planet. Um, and you know, I guess I guess you could say, well, he invents this guy just just after um, a breakup, but he's also, you know, he's still. Believe me, everyone looks young to me. He's still young, but you know, you, there's a point for many of us at which you begin to realize that, oh, you know, I, 
I might not be bound for glory the way I had once thought I was. And, you know, and, and we live with that in, in, in various ways. And Robbie's solution, he sort of tries to assure himself there's no harm in it, is, is to sort of, yeah, sort of give birth to um, a better, a quote unquote, better version of Robbie who doesn't have to age, who doesn't have to get sick, who doesn't have to ever experience failure of any kind, though, mm -hmm. as, as the, as it goes on, Wolf gets more complicated and less and less happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it, interesting to me because um, you know, I, it, social media is another thing that I, you know, that that I think novels often struggle to to mm. matter persuasively. You know, sometimes yeah. I, feel like, you know, you'll you'll sort of see people placing like imaginary Twitter feeds in their novel, and you'll just think this doesn't feel all that convincing to me. Um, it, in this case, it's completely so, and I think for the obvious reason that it's that it's really anchored to uh, character, to who Robbie and you know, and who these people, who, who Robbie and, and Isabel are. Um, but um, but speaking of of Wolf, um, you know, strong novels I think always tend to be in conversation with other novels and other writers, and and I think historically your books have have sometimes been even more overtly so than you know. Um, Right? I mean, Specimen Days with Walt Whitman, The Hours, of course, with Virginia Woolf. And this book seems to contain, again, the spirit of Virginia Woolf, not just in the nomenclature of that Instagram handle. But, um, you know, there's a little passage in the middle section that seems to kind of nod to, to the White House, uh, mm -hmm. to the Time Passage section. There's, there's uh, you know, uh, but, all, but, but, you know, beyond that, I think also Wharton, who mentioned before, Wharton kind of flits around the edges of this novel. George Eliot, very much. Um, David and I, when we, when we were talking, David pointed out some correspondence with Whitman. I hadn't noticed, I think, in, in some of uh, Nathan's observations. And, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I was just yeah. wondering about, you know, obviously those writers are not offering a, a kind of structuring, um, uh, you know, kind of element in this book exactly. Um, but they're, but they're, they're extruding into it enough that I wanted to ask you about that. You know, what sort of why, what is it about, you know, in those cases, you know, uh, right. writers that, that brought them into this book. Yeah, I think like a lot of people who write, you know, I'm I'm a book geek. Um, and, and Virginia Woolf and Walt Whitman and other writers um, matter enormously to me. And I, I think, you know, I, I also think about my husband and my friends and actual living people, but I also think about these, these people whose, whose work just knocked me out and turned me around. And, you know, I, I, I've probably gotten at least as much out of my one-sided love affair with Virginia Woolf as I have with, you know, Oh, 75 or so aborted boyfriends. Um, <laughs> so these these people are real to me, and so they find their way into the books. And um, you know, I I really do not read reviews, but you know, word reaches you anyway. And um, I know that some that some people feel that I'm sort of how. Oh, trying to claim some kind of legitimacy, um, which I kind of am, but you know. Um, no, well, maybe, uh, anyway, anyway, but it, it's often received that way. And my, my feeling is, um, no, I just, you know, I, I, I think about pets and sex and Walt Whitman and all, you know, right. right. I I think, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Extras of, of, of one's life. I, I kind of have to agree with that. It, it's, uh, almost impossible to write a book without feeling those people crowding in and wanting to let them in because that's part of what writing is, you know? Well, you know, my students um, are, and even even older writers who are not my students um, are often really nervous about being overly influenced by a great writer. Yeah. And um, what I always tell the students is, you know, Go ahead, spend a little time 
writing fake Toni Morrison or or fake Dennis Johnson, don't worry, you're not going to turn into Toni Morrison or Dennis Johnson, but but you might just come out of that phase with a Morrison or Johnson chip in your in your mind. And and so you write as yourself, but also a little bit filtered through the writers who have spoken so powerfully to you. Yeah. So I think, go ahead. Yeah, bring it on. Let's, let's, let's uh, show me another fake Ray Carver story. <laughs> that, he used to be especially popular. To yeah, I remember. <laughs> well, I, we have uh, we have about uh, 10 more minutes and I want to let the audience know that we are both uh, Matthew and I have like one more question each. We're going to uh, ask to Michael, but you, if you have questions that you want to post to Michael, please write them in our comment section and they'll be looked at and we'll hopefully get around to asking some questions from the audience. So uh, um, Matthew, maybe you can. Sure. Yeah. I, well, I, th I think, <laughs> wait, wait, did you want to ask your question about, about time? I did, but you know, I don't know if we have time. For, yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we, we've been, I guess we can, we, uh, we really, this quite your question and mine, we're, we're in some ways gesturing towards questions about the book's um, structure. Um, you know, David's question was noting that in your, in, in your body of work, the hours, specimen, days, days right. You know, right, that, 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 that time, you know, tends to extrude itself into the titles, um, and you know, and this this has a, a kind of it calls itself as a theme, and people wrestling with time. You know, even in, in right, day, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it it is my sense that with I I can't really think of an exception. Narrative is just nailed to the passage of time. <laughs> Poetry, maybe not so much, but you know, you just can't. A story involves sequence, a sequence involves time, and you could probably give pretty much any novel to somebody and say, I hope you like this book. It's about the effects of the passage of time. <laughs> Not necessarily chronological, but you know, you know what I mean. And I guess it's what it, all it gets down to is that some of us are sort of more directly, for who knows what reason, um, concerned about the passage of time than others of us. And, you know, it's a, as a, another one of those, I don't know things, but it's always been something to me to really be aware of, of whether it's different periods in history or, or two o'clock versus three o'clock. And, and of course it is, I've always felt that the, you know, kind of figuring out the period of time that a novel will cover is such a, an enormous part of the game, you know, <laughs> that once you, once you have a sense of what the temporal limits are, everything else yeah, kind of yeah. begins. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's one, it's one of the things you kind of have to figure out as you, for me, as I, as I write a book is, yeah, how, how much time does it encompass, um, how long does it want to be? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, almost everything should be shorter, but, um, <laughs> you know, you, it, it's it's one of the sort of, I think sort of under-discussed aspects of, of putting a novel through a draft and another and another is you're trying to sort of, mm. I guess I would say discover its tensile strength. Like, yeah. um, you know, you could, you could easily, string a piece of twine across the room I'm in. You couldn't, you, you couldn't string it, uh, you couldn't do it with twine in the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting it's you mentioned. You there's mentioned. that physical aspect of a narrative and its relationship to length and time that you kind of figure out as you go along. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you used a twine metaphor. I heard you talking about the structure oh, the of <laughs> It's a twine. Yeah, I had envisioned it like on Brad Listy's podcast. I think it was the other people podcast. And I heard you say something that it, you know, that that you you envisioned it as sort of like a piece of twine passing through a brick, um, which I thought was such yeah. a 
such a fascinating visual, you know, because I do think, do think novels have a kind of visual, you know, they, there's like, there are visual analogs that are very important to the writer. They're kind of how you, you know, how, how you shape them. And yet to people reading them, they, they probably don't yeah. see exactly that figure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, that particular metaphor is just, yeah, my, my sense of this particular book where the, the, the string is the story and, and the, the, the brick is um, the pandemic. Right. Mm -hmm. it, goes one, it goes in one side and comes out the other. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, still yeah. That's a Before we, we get to the audience questions, we'll leave time for that. Michael, I want to ask you one last Question. I, I read somewhere that you've said some people cannot forgive you for not writing the hours again and again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'm wondering what it's what that's like for you to, to write and continue to create in the wake of having a particular novel of yours be so well loved that nobody that people want you to write it again and again. So but also in general, how does a writer or an artist in general, prepare oneself to approach the craft and grow and hopefully become even more powerfully oneself when there are these expectations that you don't change or just repeat yourself. You know, when they announced the Pulitzer, I was genuinely su surprised. I, I'm, it didn't, anyway. Um, and I was sort of stunned and happy for maybe three days and then <laughs> depressed for almost a year. Yeah. For all the obvious, you know. Why? Because I've heard people say this before too, but I'm curious for you, how, why? What was the? Well, um, it was a sense that, as I said, I, I may, this this may never happen again. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still rel I was still relatively young, and I thought, and I thought, whoa, 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 do I, you know, do I, of course you want that kind of recognition, but do I really, really, is it going to be good for me in the long run? Um, when I, when I actually got the little, the little paper, the little tchotchke that is the prize itself, I, um, <laughs> home with, well, it's, it's, it's an underwhelming object. <laughs> it's, it's all symbolic. It's, it's like a little paperweight. Um, yeah. Um, and I got home with Kenny, my husband, and I just held it up. The prize said, Michael Cunningham, the pre has been years. Oh, 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 no. oh, but no. after enough time had passed, yeah. I thought, you know what? Hey, if, if, if you weren't stopped by under recognition, it would be really stupid to be stopped by over recognition. But you know that's that's part of it. Like like now you know now people will really know that I'm overpraised. Not you know, don't don't get me started. But um yeah, and then I think that's also a reaction like that is sort of an in, insult to all the people who could get Pulitzer prizes and don't. You know, it's yeah. it's. There is a crapshoot element to it. It's the right book at the right time, and you get the prize, and other people don't. Um, plus, uh, well, I was right, you know, I because right again. On, on one hand, I think people want the hours over and over again. But then, yeah. if you did that, people would hate you for that too. Exactly. You can't. Well, there's no winning there. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they have it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And but I think that response seems, you know, enormously human. And I think people often don't, you know, particularly when it comes to writers. Everybody has this sort of dream of what publishing is like, and and it's, you know, it, it isn't that. <laughs> you know, it, isn't that. <laughs> it goes well. It's, you know, in fact, sometimes when it goes well, it can be worse. It can be worse. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. 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 No. I found that if often when I mentioned luck, yeah. um, starting with sort of 
sending the right story to the New Yorker at the right time and on from there. People mm. mostly don't want to hear it. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Did, did you find that too? Well, I mean, I haven't been in the New Yorker, but, <laughs> yeah. but you no, know, it's it's people, they don't, they don't, they don't like it. People don't like the idea. People yeah. don't like the idea. Exactly. Yeah. They, it, it, I think it's, it's probably, oh, 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 just shut up with your self facing <laughs> nonsense. But it's also, I think it's something deeper than that. It's, it, it's, it's, um, but people want it to be hard work and inspir you know they, they, it's it's they, they it, want they want to believe that it's that it's a you know a thing that comes from from you know merit or or right 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 it's probably sort of a more american thing like like you earn you worked hard and earned this and having also been in the right place at the right time has nothing to do with it but it's also true that you worked hard and did earn it and did deserve it oh. and you're lucky to be at the right time, the right place. It's oh, not yeah, true. yeah, I, I, yes, all true. It's 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 just that people are people. But luck is hard, that we can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, also, I talk to my students about this too. Um, part of it is just keeping at it until you get lucky. You know. Because if you're finally in the right place at the right time, for how many years were you in the wrong place at the wrong time? Yeah. So there's that too. I mean, I, I when, whenever, sometimes younger writers, I'm sure this happens to all of us, ask you for advice. And the only, I don't, I don't really give advice, but all I can say, don't panic, don't stop. Don't, yeah, don't, just keep don't let yourself believe that nothing will ever happen, even if that proves to be true, but. Yeah. Exactly. That's that's where, that's where I see because I've, I've I've worked I, you know, I've taught for years and I worked with some really really gifted young student writers um, and some of them just give up too soon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of them do. You know, there's a slightly oh I don't I, I there may have to I really want to talk to the audience of. Don't yeah, let's get, let's get the audience. We could we could go on and on for this, and or we could do, or we could just stop and talk to other people too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's bring, the, well, let's bring the audience into it. Okay, we've got probably got more audience questions than uh, than. We don't have time to get through. Yeah, I'm gonna ask. Well, let's, let's do two. Let's do one from from Albert Zaleski Bimbasa here, um, which is um, thank you for your generosity in doing this program for Culture Connection, Mr. Cunningham. Can you make a statement on the current rash of book bans at school and private libraries in the USA and restrictions on drag queen story hours? Kind of a large question, but uh... it's a large question, which 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 has a, which has a simple answer. It is really fucked up. I'm, I mean, you know, there there's no there's no two sides to that story. No, right. you know, it 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 is it is a it is a attempt it's, it's a it's a power grab on the part of certain people it's um it's trying to it's it's an attempt to sort of outlaw difference um it's just it's terrifying to me and 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 um and you know and, and yes and I, I i i guess it seems like you know, I'm sure people are, these people are genuine assholes. Um, but it's also about, it's, it's also something to rally others, others against. Um, you know, do you, do you, do you know what's on the shelves of the, of the school library where your children can just pick it up and, and, you know, read about homosexuals and other kinds of people? <laughs> Yeah, it, it seems like, um, you know, obviously, too, it's like it's a it's a kind of moral panic or a, a thing that sort of that the right is using, you know, it has nothing to do with the books themselves or what's actually there. And it's much more about yeah. pedagoguing. Um, yeah, I think I think there's an element, I, I, like I said, I think these are genuinely impassioned people with some really bad ideas. And it's also an element of calculation, like, you know, anything we can and and, you know, say to any crowd many crowds i want to do what's best for our children yeah and you know who's going to stand up and say no i think we should really do things that are bad for our children <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I just am going looking at these other. Uh, you want one more question? We have time for. Yeah. Do we have? Is there time for another one, Eve? Or are we? Is that okay? Um, well, let's try one more. Let's just do yeah. it. Uh, okay. Uh, here's one from Al, Al, Olive Pendergast. Um, how do you balance the physical description of reality against the inner world or ideas in the larger picture? I, I, I think the question here is, you know, sort of like, uh, yeah, there it is. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And I mean, I think um, you know, some some of us obviously are more concerned with the physical world than others of us, but. Um, I think I can sort of answer that with an example. So I, I sometimes in my in one of my in my classes will have the students go out and as unobtrusively as possible observe someone, um, and but only make a list of what you can see. And it's not mm -hmm. it's not creative. It's 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 like you know perceived gender, race. You know, and then and then, how do they stand? How do they walk? What are they wearing? Um, no speculation, mm -hmm. unless unless someone actually well gets into a plumber's truck. You can't imagine that they might be a plumber. And you come, we come back and into the room and you go around and people read like like a lot, like 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 twenty physical qualities they've seen in this person and. It never fails. A being begins to emerge. Wow. If if it, if it is more of our inclination to sort of start with a body of characteristics and some kind of soul, and then add, you know, dress it up in flesh, that can work. But it also works in reverse. Wait, what, what, what do you mean? You, uh, oh, right. Start yeah. Oh, yeah. if, if, if you sufficiently physically imagine somebody, yeah. they grow an inner life. They grow a soul. It, it's a little counterintuitive, but I've seen it happen over and over. Yeah, yeah, that's that's um, that's lovely. I, I had a conversation with you know some writers recently who were kind of talking about physical description, which seems like a you know a thing where um, you know I find I, I hear writers kind of arguing against it, which seems you know because there are surely there are writers who who are not. You know, who are less interested in that, or who sort of mm -hmm. it, it feels almost like you know. There now, there I've heard people kind of argue, oh, you know, physical description is, you know, is is bad. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and I thought, ridiculous, it possibly be like you know. No, well, oh, honey, physical description will be at your funeral. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, right. anyway, right. I, yeah, and. Thank you. Everything. I'm just, uh, boo. Um, we seem to want to apply some set of principles or rules to fiction. You know, like physical description is bad. This is bad. That is bad. And not one of them holds up. Not a single one. It's it's magic, and this this book might work for me and not for you. But but there's nothing. Not even even show don't tell. Yeah. Yeah. Just really yeah. Stuff. yeah. Yeah. No. It's. I mean, obviously. I mean, imagine that that, that everybody might go about it a little differently and, and find different. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's what, what we love about it. Yeah. 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 As long as the voice gets you, you know. As long as, as you, especially if you're a language whore, as long as the voice gets, you, as long as 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 long as something hooks you and pulls you in yeah. and. You know, it's an it's an irretrievably subjective experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I, I tell, I in literature class we read. It's all short stories, but we read like thirty or so short stories, and I always tell the students that um, they're free to. It's an emotional and an intellectual experience. They're free to respond or not respond to whatever we've read though if you liked it or didn't like it we'll talk about why what was what did it lack what did it have too much of and um i, I always feel like and if i've chosen 30 stories that are going to be loved by 
every single one of you, I have failed. <laughs> you know, yeah. I have adequately represented for you the range of stories and how, why would you want to write something that's going to be like Everybody, that? yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and likewise, it could be very useful to read writing that you dislike, <laughs> you know, to, to, to kind of find out why you might not. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. the position in relation to it might, might have changed. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know. Well, I feel we like self. Yeah. Sorry, we go back to. Oh no! I, I, you go back to a book ten years later that you didn't like or did like, and and you know the book is the same, but but you're not the same. Yeah. So. Yeah. I feel selfishly, Michael, that we could keep you here talking oh, for what? another hour, oh. but it's our our allotted time is supposed to be an hour, and our audience is. Uh, sure, probably could hear more too, but we have to respect your time. But uh, it's been an honor for me and a pleasure to yeah. have you here. And, and uh, nice. it's been fantastic. You. And you are, and I'm, uh, you know, I was invited by Dan Zaleski and Cultural Connections, but I was very happy. But I want to thank them and also on behalf of them, thank you, Michael, for coming here to for the Queen's Public Library uh, series here. It's such an honor. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Michael, Matthew? Yeah, I, I, I just want to say the same. I've, I've been like, lucky enough to do to participate in a number of these conversations, but it was particularly gratifying to do it with you, Michael, because I've been reading it with great delight for 30 years, I realized the other day, and uh, it seems impossible. I mean, I just graduated from high school. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that just happened. How could it have been thirty years? Uh, but it, it's really, um, it's really a great, great. Well, just, it's an honor for me. It's an honor for me too. I mean, as libraries are under attack in every possible way. Yep. And um, thank you both, and every single person who tuned in. Um, thank you for caring about books. Yeah, indeed. That's what keeps them alive. Yeah. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night.